It's good to be hanging out with the people that realize that camping in a thunderstorm is not that great, <laughs> right? Man, alive. Patty and I got away, and it was, it was rain, 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 and then after that, there was some more rain, then thunder, then rain. Anyway, it's great to see you. Hey, very few things the Lord uh, really told us we ought to do. We do a lot more things than he actually asked us to do. You know that, don't you? One of the things that he said is uh, you need to be baptized and you need to make disciples. So we are working pretty hard on all of the deliverables so that you can put real handles on what it means to be a disciple and to grow in discipleship. Uh, that's rolling out this fall. We keep working that. We've spent a lot of time on that. We'll continue to do that. In the meantime, I would like to baptize you. Jesus said you ought to be baptized. If you've not been baptized, you know, you ought to be. So if you'd like to be baptized, two weeks from today, there's all the stuff in your program. But take a look, read about it, write it down on your white card. We have tithes and offering in white card boxes mounted against the wall. Put that down. We'll send you some stuff, get you on the list, and it'll be great. It's a really wonderful time. So I want to baptize you. Let me tell you that. Okay. We have a lot of people signed up already, but I want to baptize more. It's my favorite thing. It is my favorite thing in ministry. And I think probably because of the way that the presence of God moves across the water. I know that probably sounds weird unless you've been baptized here, but it just you know what I mean? It's just beautiful. So I'd like to be a part of that. Anyway, I'm really thankful for uh, Dave doing his uh, talk last week. And I wanted him to share his story in the context of suffering and, and to talk about abandonment. Patty and I watched uh, yesterday morning on YouTube and cried, I'm sure, with you. Uh, man, it was meaningful to me. So special thanks to Dave Palmer for all the work in doing worship and bringing the teaching time. So thank you, David. Yeah. <clears throat> Last week, um, Dave said that he wanted to do a one-point talk because he just wants you to remember one thing, which that's not a bad idea. I've done many pointless talks, so you can imagine <clears throat> how good I felt he had one. So what he wanted you to go away with last week is that silence on God's end does not mean absence. That's the huge, big takeaway, and that's one of the themes through all of this. And, uh, you know, we just have a few more talks as we look at the life of Job and the circumstances and who God is and how all this stuff works out in the middle of our suffering. And interestingly enough, nowhere else other than in Luke when you have the story of the rich man and Lazarus, which is the only story that Jesus told in the Bible where someone had a name. So you wonder, is this a parable or is he actually telling us this is the way that this is going to be? Nowhere else in the Bible do we get to pull back the curtain and peek into the corridors of a bigger place than we've ever been aware of and hear a conversation and experience um, a life that is being put on the, you know, on the blocks without him even knowing. Job had no idea. It's so easy to talk about so many things that have happened, but this hasn't happened to him yet. And, and you know we've talked about it every week and setting the context that he, he didn't do anything wrong. He, he was an amazing guy, and he had prospered, and he was blameless. He had a great family, and they all loved each other, and he had a wonderful spiritual life. And so in the corridors of the, of the heavens, there is this conversation between good and evil, between God and Satan himself, and, uh, and it starts off with one of my favorite things, you know, after God says, hey, where have you been, to Satan, and Satan you know, says, we're roaming the world and everything, and, and then he goes, have you seen my boy Job? I love that because so many times we think that, that you know God threw Job under the bus, but no, he's going home. I see my boy Job. That's my boy. He is doing good. He is he is the guy. I'm so proud of him. And then the big test comes, and uh, he loses absolutely everything. And and then when it couldn't get any worse, he has three friends show up. And it's beautiful for the first week because they're mourning his death because it's obvious he's going to die, which goes to the whole notion that we really don't know anything, do we? Because he didn't die. But they were sure he was going to die, so they're there as good friends to mourn with him. 
And then he doesn't die, and so his three friends have to explain why bad people suffer, which isn't even the right question. If there was a question, it'd be, why do good people suffer? But he's, you know, each one of these three guys are answering the question, and, and here's one enough. There's no reason for facts, you know, when you've got a good theory going, right? These guys just are speaking theoretically, trying to fix something that really actually doesn't need fixed. If there's anyone that needs fixed in the story, it'd be his friends. There's a lot to learn about how to show up to people when they're suffering. And then in a reckless moment, in this you know, sense of confused abandonment that Job is feeling, with all of his dialogue that keeps turning, 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 Job says, that's it. And Dave alluded to this last week, that there's really a, like a court scene that is taking place. And Job is calling God out. Time for you to get into court. And then the sparks fly. In his angry moment, then, here's what Job says in Job 31, 35. If only someone would listen to me. Look, I, I will sign my name to the defense, so you can start hearing the, the legal terms in the courtroom. Let the Almighty answer me, me. Let my accuser write out the charges against me. I'm calling you out, God, and now you're on the stand, pal. You're the one that's going to have to answer. Let's just see what you have to say for yourself. So that's a pretty frustrating place right there, and he had a lot of reasons to be frustrated. But then his fourth friend shows up, who actually has a lot of really good stuff to say. He just doesn't put it out there adequately, or even correctly, or even respectfully. This fourth friend is so frustrated at Job because of the four charges that Job brings up against God. And so this is a big, long passage of Scripture, a whole lot of dialogue, but instead of spending time with everything that, that, that Elihu said and everything that Job said, we're just going to take a look at, at a piece of each one of these four questions that Job is calling God into account on. And, and here are the four things. He says, um, you know, God, God will not communicate with me. He's not communicating with me. And then secondly, that um, God is not fair. He throws that out there. And third, that God doesn't care. And then finally, that he won't and probably can't even help me. So there are these four big statements that come out in Job's frustration. And Elihu, the young friend, he loses it and starts blasting Job instead of just listening and waiting. And so today we're going to listen to Job's response to Elihu's hard love and basically see that Job cannot be heard because of his good friend's angry delivery, because that can happen. So the first allegation uh, is um, God won't communicate. He just won't communicate. So Job 33, verse 12 through 14, here we go. Um, but you are wrong, and I will show you why. This is actually, I said this backwards. It's Elihu's response to Job. But you are wrong. I will show you why. For God is greater than any human being. So why are you bringing a charge against him? Why say that he does not respond to people's complaints? For God speaks again and again, though people don't recognize him. So this is his friend's response to the very first allegation that God isn't willing to communicate. If you're taking notes, number one, God is not silent. He speaks through pain. He really does. In fact, according to Elihu, if you look at the bigger response from him to Job, he speaks in several different ways. He speaks in a supernatural way. I don't know if you have ever been in a place where you heard God's voice. I have been in that place about three times in my life where I heard God's voice. When the televangelist showed up and every week they heard God's voice and it always had something to do with, about, you know, with money, I, I, I didn't feel so free to share what I'm sharing with you right now, but hopefully I've got enough credit so that you can hear that and say, wow, okay, so that does happen. Some of you have heard God's voice. He speaks supernaturally. Or he will put words and thoughts in your mind 
that are not your words and thoughts, and you know because you wouldn't have had those words or thoughts. You wouldn't have put them together that way, and you would definitely not have had those words and thoughts because you may be more selfish than the thought that just got put in your head. So he speaks supernaturally. God also speaks out of his book, out of the Bible. It is amazing to me how I can read the, the Bible over and over and over and over again. And one of the great report cards on whether I'm growing or not is how I am attentive to and hearing new things from the Holy Spirit in the stories I've read over and over and over. I, there are so many times where I've said, I can't believe I've ever read that before. Patty and I do that all the time. You know, my mom, 86 years old, she goes, did you know? And then we'll launch off on a passage of Scripture. I'll go, you know what? I, I don't remember even reading that ever, but I have. So God speaks. predatory animals, their prey. When I got kicked in my leg, I instantly learned a couple of things. Pain instructs. It does. C.S. Lewis said this, and this is great. It's so good I put it on the board, that uh, pain insists upon being attended to, that God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Isn't that great? And, and then another way that, that Elihu says God speaks is in the context of relationship, and that means that my suffering might be more than just about me. My suffering might have more to do with someone else than it actually has to do with me. Now, you may be sitting there going, look, man, you don't have any idea what I'm going through. You know, in saying that's what happens in suffering. Listen, when you think of the moment in your past, you just think of one for just a second. Just take 10 seconds and think about a moment in your past when, when God spoke to you. You either heard his voice or impressed something upon you or there was a, an unbelievable situation where at the end of it, uh, you said, okay, that was a God thing. Okay, you got it? You got one of those? If you don't, there's a reason why, and we can talk about that later. Okay? If you have that in your mind, I can guarantee you that there was probably pain involved. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about, just so everybody can just see. Yeah, you see that? You see that? God speaks in our pain. He does. And we want to push away the pain so God can talk. No, no. 
You don't push away the pain so that God can talk. You lean into the pain and you have the talk. Elihu, you know, addresses him really well. And so this is a moment now where he should lay that out there and just stop and shut up and listen. But no, 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 he's upset, man. He's addressing Job with his second indictment, which is God isn't fair. He's not fair. The bad guys always get all the stuff and they, you know, they get bad stuff. They're bad guys, but the bad stuff isn't as bad as my bad stuff. And, and so Elihu just jumps right in and Job 34 12 through 14, he says, Truly, God will, do, will not do wrong. He doesn't do wrong. The Almighty will not twist justice. Did someone else put the world in his care? Who set the whole world in place? In other words, he's saying, Job, you have no idea what the great God of justice is doing. You have no idea whatsoever. And then he said, if God were to take his spirit and withdraw his breath, and then you'll notice that that stops right there. There's a whole rest of that sentence, but you just stop with me and you think, what does that mean? Think about that thought, that God would withdraw the Holy Spirit from the planet, that he would take away what he has breathed into creation from the earth. You ever thought of that? Job had never thought of that. Look at Job 34, 15, and 17. He says, basically, all of life would cease and humanity would would turn again to dust. You would be floor sweepings, Job, just so you know. Is it like we've earned something here? And, 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 and what we really want is what we deserve from God? Is, it, is that what we're asking? Because let me just tell you, you don't want what you deserve. You don't. You say, well, I, I just want what's coming to me, God. No, you don't. No, you don't. What you want is grace, which is love you haven't earned, and mercy, which is not getting what you do deserve. So he goes on, Elihu says, now, now listen to me if you're wise. Pay attention to what I say. Could God govern if he hated justice? Are you going to condemn the almighty judge? The whole idea here is that the, the entire concept of justice and the judicial system actually comes out of God. Fortunately, it's tempered by grace, but it comes from God. And Elihu's saying, I'm not going to let you do that, man. I'm not going to let you say that God isn't fair. I'm not going to let you. It's number two in your notes. God isn't unjust. He actually holds me together in my brokenness. That's what his justice does. Elihu is, uh, is missing the first skill of loving, which is listening. You know that? The first skill of loving is listening and we know that because he misquotes job now and because he doesn't listen carefully job's out of the conversation that ever happened to you where someone hears something that you actually didn't say or misquotes you and wants to deal with you in a conversation around something you actually didn't say you're not in that conversation so job is out as Elihu jumps into the third big indictment here, which is God doesn't care. He doesn't care. I mean, look at all that I'm going through. It's obvious he doesn't care because of all of this pain. So his friend Elihu says in 35, verse 12 through 14, and when they cry out, God does not answer because of their pride. Th there's a reason why when we cry out at times, we don't hear for a while. But he says it's wrong to say that God doesn't listen, to say that the Almighty isn't concerned. You say that you can't see him, but he will bring justice if you will only, what? What is the word? Oh, we hate that word. Oh, that's a bad word. Don't you hate the word wait? Oh, my goodness, I hate the word wait. See, his buddy's saying that the waiting is prolonged by pride, not about whether God cares or not. It's about, it's about Job showing up so God can work in his timing. Now, I'm going to go deep with you here, okay? Are you ready? Waiting in the Hebrew means 
waiting. That's pretty deep right there. You got that? Now, we're gonna, let's talk about it some more. In verse you know, 15 and 16 in the same chapter, he's, Elihu says, you say he does not respond to sinners with anger and is, not, uh, and is not greatly concerned about wickedness, but you are talking nonsense, Job. You've spoken like a fool because you need to wait, but your pride is in the way. In all of this, your pride is in the way. See, Job's problem is not that, that he wants to wait for God, it's that he wants to be done waiting. He, he wants to wait for God without waiting. You ever wanted to wait for God without waiting? Yeah. And he's not waiting. This dialogue continues. There is no breath. There is no air. There's no place for God to show up in this. Have you ever done that? Have you ever had the patience with someone and you just sat there and you thought, well, whenever, you know, when you're done, and maybe you've even said it, when you're done, let me know. Let me know when you're done. Yeah. He's building, and this is what happens when you don't wait. You start building a story about the nature of God. That he is all of this and he's not any of that. That he's indecisive and he's vague. And, and he is a God of ambiguity. And we build all of these sick caricatures of of who he is because we're not waiting. Listen, if you are waiting on God, you'll probably have to wait. <laughs> are you starting to get the sense here? Because waiting in arrogance isn't waiting. See, if you're going to explain to God what he can't seem to understand, if you're going to tell God what the answer is and what the fix is and what the obvious solution is that he had to be responding to, that is arrogance. W waiting just flips on its backside in the presence of arrogance, in the presence of pride. And here's why we hate it so bad. When you wait on someone, they're in control, and you're not. I don't like that, do you? I don't like that. You know who waits? You know who gets paid to wait? Waiters. So I call them waiters. Have you ever gone to a restaurant, and they walked up to you and said, I'll tell you what you're going to have. You go, well, wait. And that's why I call you a waiter. Just wait. You know, I'll tell you what you're going to have. I got stuff going on, and my kids got a ball game later, and I got to get home. You're going to have the special. And I don't have time to tell you what that is. <laughs> wait. See, God speaks in the waiting precisely because he cares, because he knows how rich the waiting is. Number three in your notes, God isn't ambivalent. He actually cares. He does. And you're going, okay, Elihu, this would be a great place to shut up and let the words sink in, okay? Just, just calm down, back up, let him think about this. But no, 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 he, he's not done. No, he wants to address the, the statement that, that God won't and probably can't even help, probably can't even do it. So Job 36 Elihu says, God is mighty, but he does not despise anyone. He's mighty in both power and understanding. He does not let the wicked live, but gives justice to the afflicted. In other words, he may not pay at the end of every day, but at the end, God pays. That's Anne of Austria. God may not pay at the end of every day, but at the end, God pays. See, he never, this, and this is what, and this is true. Eli, Elihu's words are good. It's just how he's delivering them. He never takes his eyes off the innocent, but he sets them on thrones with kings and exalts them forever. Now, that's pretty good. Just be the innocent one then. Well, I don't know how that strikes you, but, you know, I'm not innocent. 
you know? Great, brilliant plan, God. Perfectly timed, right? Except it is perfectly timed because of Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us so that we might be innocent before God. That's pretty good. Well, what comes with that? Look at the verse. He never takes his eyes off the innocent, but he sets them on thrones with kings and exalts them forever. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if he is the Lord of your life, then God sees you as the innocent made right one and he enthrones you with the kings and exalts you. That's pretty darn good. Well, he goes on, verse 36, if they're bound in chains and caught up in a web of trouble, he shows them the reason. He's talking about the innocent people like us. He shows them their sins of pride. He gets their attention and commands that they turn from evil. So Elihu's saying, look, he, he, he has the power, and, and he actually has a plan for working out his power in your life, and he knows the end of my story. And you go, yeah, I, I believe that, except in my suffering, I lose patience. I just lose patience. I don't want to slow down in suffering. But a lot of times, I have to slow down if I'm going to be able to live in what God wants me to learn in my suffering. Number four, God isn't powerless. Sometimes he just stalls so I can learn. I mean, you think about it. If I'm going to override the conversation with all of my thoughts and all of my arrogant solutions, why would he do anything until I'm finally done running that course? So these three friends that are trying to, to answer the wrong question, and then, and then Elihu, the fourth guy who's got all the really good, good answers, but, but he's so angry and doesn't leave any space to breathe, there's some stuff to learn here, and I just want to go through this because, and I've, we've talked about this, I talked about it a couple weeks ago, we need to know how to show up for our people when they're suffering, okay? So I'm going to give you some things I haven't given you before, even though I've given you a few things on this already. I'm going to give you an A through E. A, don't be the Holy Spirit, okay? You know who's really good at being the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, thank you. Don't be the Holy Spirit. I've had people say, many, many, many times, you know, here's what's going to happen, and here's what God says, and here's, and here's, and here's, and they just take a really complex situation and give a very, very simple answer, so they feel better and walk away. Don't be the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be the Holy Spirit. B, don't judge another person's motives. You don't know their heart. You don't. C, don't project your problems onto them as you're dealing with the suffering. I talked about that a few weeks ago, you know, when you go to a hospital and you start talking about the worst hospital experiences you've ever had while the person's laying down in front of you, which is already awkward, right? Don't project your problems. D, don't demand a conclusion. Let God work. And E, don't make promises uh, uh, for God. Don't do that. Don't grab Bible verses out of context and throw them out there so that it feels like you did a really good job showing up. Don't do that. In all that is going on, God is building a great conversation. We know that if we've read all of Job. We know that. He's building this great conversation because in all of the despair, Job has distorted who God is. So God's just listening, putting together his piece. And you know what? We do that. I talk to people all of the time, and maybe there's some people here today that are just so angry at God and are not where they want to be with God or where they could be with God. They don't know how much more there is in relationship with God because in their pain, in their very real pain and trauma and suffering, they've distorted who God must be as a result of that. God wants to be in the right conversation, but we get ourselves out of the conversation and we build a new one based on our timing and our understanding and our quick fixes and, and, and our limited resources. So now God's going to speak. And, and God is saying, I'm here, Job. 
uh, you may want to buckle up. And I think it's great because he doesn't bring solutions, he brings questions. He actually brings 77 questions for Job to think about. So this is how that starts, and we're not going to go through all those, but here's how it starts. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, Who is this that questions my wisdom with such arrogant words? Then he says, Put on your seatbelt, big boy, because I've got some questions for you. And you've got to answer these questions, okay? You think we're going to be in court? I'm on the stand? Okay. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me about that. You know so much. Who determines its dimensions and stretched out the surveying lines? Did you, you have that? You have your copy of the blueprints on how I put all that together, Job? What supports the earth's foundations? And who laid its cornerstones as the morning stars sang together and all of the angels shouted for joy? I mean, you, you got that answer, right, Job? And then he goes into 10 creation questions, you know. What is it I put in a donkey's brain so that if he's domesticated and gets cut loose, he knows how to live in the wild? You, you know that, right? He goes through these 10 amazing questions about creation. And then it gets apparent real quick, and he goes through 10 more questions. Then he talks about Leviathan, this great huge beast. It, it, it becomes you know, it becomes really apparent very fast that Job isn't God and that he doesn't have an answer for any of those questions and that what he's going through in light of everything that God is is kind of small stuff. Now, I'm not saying that we're supposed to minimize what we're going through because of how great God is. I'm saying that when we stop and listen to God and we read his word and we make ourselves available to him, we realize that he can manage all of our stuff really, really well. And, and now we find Job in a brand new kind of school here, and now he is silent. He's upset because God is silent and thinking God's absent. Now he's the one that's taking the silent stand. Number five in your notes, God saves his deepest lessons for the storm. I have said over and over again, the things that I like the most about me are the things I learned in situations I never want to ever go through again. Amen? Oh, yeah. So, Job responds back, Job 40. Um, or the Lord says to Job, do, do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You, you are God's critic, but you have the answers. Then Job says, I got nothing. And those 77 questions, I got nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. God's saying, you, you want me in court, Job? Here I am. Go ahead, cross-examine me. And Job says, I got nothing, man. Number six, when I stop, then I can hear. When I stop. I have a, a friend, uh, Dr. Timothy Ye. He's got five PhDs. And he's Chinese, grew up in China, learned everything about herbology and acupuncture. He has allopathic and homeopathic, both uh, medical degrees, and, and he's one of the most brilliant people I know. Um, but back in the day, uh, you know, he was taken captive because of his Christianity. And he was thrown into a jail cell, and he was hogtied, and he was starving, and they were mentally abusing him with all kinds of bad stories about their only child, their daughter, and what they were doing to his wife. And they worked him every single day trying to break him. And one day, Tim said that he could tell, because he's a medical doctor, that his body was breaking down, that he was dying, and the Holy Spirit finally spoke. And here's what the Holy Spirit said. You ready for this? Stop thinking. Stop thinking, Timothy. You're not alone. 
Now, you know what that means, right? The stuff that kept you awake last night that ran in the loop that you can't control and that you don't know what to do with. Stop thinking. Write it out. Read it out loud. Set it aside. Put it on an altar. Burn it in the trash can. Stop so that he can have what's his in the story, in the suffering. See, here is what God has done in the storm of, of the sin and the mess in my life. God did not give an explanation. What he did was he gave us his son. That's his answer. John three sixteen, last verse. <clears throat> For this is how God loved the world, he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. See, it is in the nature of God when his people hurt to give. And he didn't give a, a, an answer. He didn't give an answer to anything that we would have asked in our suffering. He gave us his son to suffer with us so that we could have eternal life and not be alone. So, God won't communicate. He gave us a son. Not an answer, a son. He isn't fair. Well, how fair is it to, to give his son to become a friend of sinners and to die when he did nothing wrong for our sin? God doesn't care. He gave us his son. He won't and probably can't help. He gave us his son. His son. You think about your son or your grandson or the fact that you're a son. His answer was a son in our suffering. Stand with me, would you please? Let's talk to him a little bit together. Father, uh, wow, this is really hard stuff, man, thinking about suffering and who you are and how we project our own weird agenda on who you are in our suffering and how you wait because you're a good dad, because you want us to clear the deck so we can hear from you and watch you work. And so there's a lot of us I know today, right now today, probably almost everyone here, God, I know, we're waiting and we're suffering and and so I'm, I'm asking you as our good dad would you remind us this week that to suffer well means to not bring pride and arrogance into our into our suffering but to wait to meditate into your word to let you holy spirit bathe us in your presence and give us the assurance of you with us. Help us, God, to learn how to suffer well so that we can be in the solution in your timing. And I'm, we will praise you for that. And all God's people said, amen, 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 amen. All right, love you guys. Glad to see you here today. Put your cards and everything in the boxes, and uh, I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.